Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with one of our favorite top 10 lists. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic, 10 Magnificent Things the Devoted Life Does for You. Some people think that the Christian is a real loser, and they're right, but not in the way they mean it. As our Savior said, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it, Luke 9.24. What else is lost? My sin, my purposelessness, my regrets, and my hopeless future, all gone. And in their place, I have the best possible life, in Christ, by Christ, for Christ. Let's enjoy this list. Number one, it simplifies life's objective. The Apostle Paul knew how to handle big words. He was a master of the Greek and the Hebrew, but when he distills his whole existence down to one sentence, he writes to the Philippians chapter 1, for to me, to live is Christ. That's verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ. That's it. You have to plug in what you think life is. For to me, to live is what? Sports? Making money? People have all sorts of ways that they think they're going to accomplish what they set out to do in life. But Paul said, no, this is it here. So the advantage of the devoted life, the consecrated life, is that it simplifies the objective because there's only one person to please. If I try to please people, I put my happiness in their hands. If they applaud me, then I'm overjoyed, and if they reject me, then I'm in the, in the dumps. But the great thing is, the only true perfectionist in the world is pleased even by my smallest effort. He's so gracious and so kind. And so, the the devoted life simplifies life's objective by giving me the joy of living only for the pleasure of the Lord Jesus. And we see with number two, it not only simplifies life's objective, but it focuses life's energy. Right. Uh, we can say with Paul again, this one thing I do, as opposed to these many things I dabble in. He brought everything into focus with the objective of pleasing the Lord and living for Him. And so nothing was ever lost. It focuses our energies in a way that allow us to live life to the full, always with one goal in mind. Number three, we see that it elevates life's mundane. You know, you look at people and you wonder, what gets them up in the morning? They make ball bearings or they, they work at this or that and it's the same old, same old every day. They're living to retire, living to get a little trailer in Florida or something. What is it they actually live for? The Christian life, the devoted life, takes the whole thing and turns it the other way around so that nothing is ordinary, nothing is mundane. A stopping to help someone in the rain or fixing a neighbor's lawnmower or whatever it might be, all of a sudden takes on holy service. Raising children, what are you doing? You're raising them for God. And uh, it's like at the end of the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, where we read there's a day coming when instead of simply having holiness to the Lord on the miter of the high priest, it'll be on the cooking pots of the wives in their kitchen. These women will be doing holy service when they're making a meal for their family. And that's exactly what the New Testament teaches us. Whether we eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Everything becomes holy service. My grandfather worked in a grocery store. He had a little butcher shop. But his little butcher block was like an altar. And it was the spiritual center of that community. And he was able to reach out to people and minister Christ to them. In what seemed to be a very mundane life, it was actually supernatural. It was otherworldly. Look at Jesus. 30 years, he begins his public ministry. What was he doing all those years? Working in a carpenter shop. That's one answer. The other answer is 
he was glorifying God. He was setting a model as a prototype for what life could be. In lives that seem so ordinary, they're actually extraordinary because they're touched with the eternal. Our fourth thing a devoted life does for us is that it gives confidence to life's prayers. The devil, he has a favorite verse, of course, and he likes to quote it, Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. And he likes to quote that verse to us. We can't let him get away with that. What should we do with our sin? Hide it from the Lord? No, pour it out, tell him the whole story. He wants us to come to him with that. And the moment we do, we once again are back in fellowship and we're able to have confidence towards God in our prayer life. So the devoted life gives us power with God. It gives us open access. We have confidence towards God because we've been transparent with him. And that goes right into number five, that it salvages life's wreckage. Right. The promise is all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. So it doesn't matter what bits and pieces we think are wasted. Nothing's wasted with God. As the Lord Jesus said to pick up the fragments that remained, nothing is wasted. And as we read through the Old Testament, to our shock, even the sins of the saints somehow find them woven into the tapestry. Who would ever think of putting down in Matthew chapter 1, introducing the Savior of the world by telling about Tamar? It's not in a footnote somewhere. It's there right in the text. This was clearly a sin, but God used it to bring about salvation by extending the line of the Messiah. No one would say that God caused Joseph's brothers to sell him into slavery or cause Potiphar's wife to frame him. And yet he could say, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. And so whatever may seem like this is a hopeless mess, look what God does with it. So in the case of Peter, the Lord said, Peter, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you, and when you're restored, strengthen your brethren. I'm going to take your failure and turn it into a ministry because that's where you can sympathize with your struggling brethren and you can offer them some hope. It's amazing. It sure is. And this next one as well, number six, it turns time into eternity. How does it do that? Well, this is the remarkable gift that God has given to us to use time in such a way that it shows up again in eternity. So they say you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. The question is, how do you send it on ahead? Well, by investing in the people who are going there. So Paul says, you are our joy and crown of rejoicing at the appearing of Jesus Christ. As we invest in people down here, and it may seem ordinary to be picking up some Sunday school kids who maybe mess up the back seat of my car, and I bring them to Sunday school or to kids club every week, or going and visiting that shut-in, that widow, whatever it might be. But God is adding it all up. And he says that he's keeping record of all this. And there's a day coming when everything will be revealed. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. The hidden things are going to be revealed. He's not talking about our sins. He's talking about the little things we did. The hand on the shoulder, the handshake, the kind word, the little visit that we've completely forgotten about and he's going to bring it to light and show us how strategic these things were in the purpose and plan of God that have resulted in eternal benefit. Number seven, it explains life's purpose. Imagine somebody who's given themselves to being able to dunk baskets on a basketball court, and he becomes an expert at it, does a great job of it. He's in the record books. Is that all there is to life? No, God has called us to be servants of Jehovah. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said, who would stoop to be a king when you can be a servant of the Lord? 
This is the greatest of all ministries. This is what gives purpose to life. Living life as a servant of God, accomplishing the will of God in this world, bringing glory to God. There's nothing greater. And, and an electrician or a plumber or a school teacher or a homemaker, any of these and all of these together can do this as part of God's great mission because he wants people in every sphere of life living out the life of Christ, manifesting Christ's life. And as Paul says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph and always makes manifest the fragrance of his presence by us in every place. And that moves right into number eight, that it avoids life's regrets. I like Psalm 34, 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. If we trust in the Lord, we may seem to have certain disappointments in life, but in the end, we will realize that the path we have taken is the very best path. Someone has said, I would plan my life just the way he's planning it if I knew as much as he did. And that's exactly true, that in the end, the truly blessed person is the person who has put their trust in the Lord. If we trust in him, we will never be let down. We will never be disappointed in the end. Number nine, it empowers life's challenges. When we're all in with God, we know God is all in with us. And so if God be for us, who can be against us? When I link myself to the power of Almighty God, when through prayer I can actually ask God to do things anywhere in the world, any time in history, God is able to do this. Right? It's astounding to think of it. But this is what the power of prayer is. The Lord Jesus put it very simply, ask my Father and he will do it for you. And so we sometimes say that the, the relative, the moral attributes of God, we can participate in, like his grace and his love. But the absolute attributes of God, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, we can have nothing to do with these. But this is what prayer is. Through prayer, we participate in the absolute attributes of God. A little old lady sitting covered by a shawl in an old folks home, she looks like she's sleeping, but she's really praying. And she's saying, Lord, I've heard about this place, Uzbekistan. I don't know where it is. I don't know what the needs are there, but you do. Would you do what you want to do in that country? I'm asking you to work, save souls, do things in that country that someday will flabbergast us. What's she doing? She's participating in God's omnipresence. She's not in Uzbekistan, but God is. And she's participating in God's omniscience. She doesn't know what they need, but God does. And she's participating in God's omnipotence. She can't help them, but God can. And so we're, we're the conduit between the infinite resources of heaven and the desperate need of man, like a little wall plug. Nothing in itself, but once it's connected to the power, look at all the things that can be done. And that's what God has set us to do. The interface between infinite resources in heaven and desperate need of the human race. That's what empowers life when we're linked with the God who can do anything. And finally, number 10, it beautifies life's influence. I've already quoted the verse, but this idea that God makes manifest the fragrance of Christ by us in every place. There's something wonderful. The prayer of the psalmist is, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. To go out into this sad and sinful world, this world of broken people, of heartache and sickness. It's a stinky world. It's a sad world. It's a dark world. And to be light in the darkness, to be aroma, to be fragrance in the stench, to, to walk through life as part of God's beautiful garden in the midst of this scrap heap of a world, it just is such a wonderful honor to 
bring the beauty of the Lord, to bring the light of the Lord, to bring the truth of the Lord, to bring the life of the Lord into this world and to be a showcase of God's mercy, to be a demonstration of God's power, and to let people know life in this world is death. But what we have in Christ is exactly what the human heart needs. So we have the opportunity of being a little sample, a little outpost of heaven, and letting people see what their life would be like if they also would receive Christ as their Savior. There is nothing like the devoted life. Anything that robs me of that simple-hearted devotion to Christ isn't worth it. May God help us to be ruthless with any idol, with any secret sin that robs us of looking up and realizing it's blue sky all the way between me and God. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Not because I'm not a sinner, but because the moment I do, instead of hiding from him, I run to him and I spread it all out before him. And he happily puts it under the blood and it's gone. And once again, like a little child, I can live a happy, artless, sincere, honest life in the presence of the Lord. The devoted life is the only life worth living.